Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Widera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, we got a full room today. A full room here. <laughs> Pretty excited too. I'm psyched. Who is our guest? <laughs> our guest is BJ. Hey. BJ, who <laughs> needs BJ. no other introduction <laughs> other than our guest is BJ. <laughs> it's like Prince. <laughs> it's like Prince. Just the BJ. Welcome to the Jerry Bell Podcast, BJ. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Eric. Um, and there's somebody else in the room. There's somebody else in the room, Ann Kelly, who's a frequent um, guest host on the Jerry Bell Podcast, social worker with the Palliative Care Service. Welcome back. Thank you. Hard act to follow after that introduction <laughs> for BJ. <laughs> Do you want to give a little intro who who this BJ okay, character is? Okay, so BJ, is? <laughs> just to give a little bit more, is a um, palliative care physician. Rock star. Rock star. Mm-hmm. Uh, Superstar. Uh, TED, ta- mm-hmm. TED Talk's been viewed over 9 million times. 9 million. 9 oh million. God, that's, that's getting close to what this Jerry Pal podcast will be <laughs> I think at. we may Almost. have had like 200 on one of our YouTube videos. Woo! Oh, woo. <laughs> that's pretty good. Yep. Three digits. 9 million. Wow. <laughs> um, and is a frequent public speaker and has has worked in hospice and palliative care in the Bay Area and elsewhere. Um, so it's terrific to have you with us, BJ. Thanks, man. Good to see you guys. We're going to start off with a song request, right? Yeah. Do you have a song for Alex to sing? Yes. Tonight you belong to me, Alex. And you're going to join me in this. I'm going to try. Perfect. I know. I know. You belong. To somebody new, but tonight you belong to me. Although, although we're apart, you're a part of my heart, but tonight you belong to me. That song sounds really familiar. Where have I heard it before? I don't know. The Jerk. (laughs) (laughs) Steve Martin. That's right. And Bernadette Peters. Well done. I got to rewatch that. Why did you pick that song? Because it's such a sweet little jingle and goes well with the ukulele. And I wanted to hear Alex. I wanted to be serenaded by Alex. (laughs) (laughs) That was terrific harmony. Thank you. I'm I'm looking forward to the end of this podcast. We can hear a little more of that. A little bit more at the end. (laughs) So BJ. You, Eric. You, you just published a huge book. I mean, Ugh. it's it's a it's a pretty big book. It's thick. Uh, but it's huge. It's getting a lot of press. I, I saw you on CNN mm-hmm. the other day. Like mm-hmm. um, the book's title, A Beginner's Guide to the End. Practical advice for living life and facing death. Mm-hmm. That's the one. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, All done. Thank God. It's been almost four years project. Why this this is uh, like whenever we have somebody who, who who writes a book and comes on to a podcast, I always think like why why <laughs> why did you put yourself through that? Because it sounds like a really arduous process. It's a little brutal. I mean, it's wonderful and horrible and everything. You know, um, I mean, the impulse was because like we all know especially clinically, you see there's, there becomes pattern recognition. You start to see themes. And yes, dying is individual and personal, absolutely. But there are themes. And more to the point is you see a lot of people suffering at the end of life totally unnecessarily because they haven't prepared, because they haven't planned, and because the system has become pretty unintuitive. So if you just leave death to chance, well, that used to be fine when you would more likely drop dead of a heart attack in the middle of playing tennis. But nowadays you're going to you're going to fade out from long bouts of chronic illness. And that, that takes some preparation. So the idea of like basically the impulse of the book was like harm, harm reduction. You know, like you see people make, where death is just way harder than it needs to be. So the book was an effort to kind of get all out of information in one place. So people had less of an excuse to ignore the subject. You know, when, when I was reading your book, the, the one line that stood out to me as far as the intro was that you wrote this book to help dying something we can get to know a little better. Mm-hmm. Like, that, yeah. mm-hmm. Is that a good summary <laughs> too? <laughs> well, on some level, okay, so on some level, a lot of the preparation, like I say, is harm reduction. Like you, you know, do these things to make things less hard, less crappy on some level. But like we all know in this work, there's also a piece of, of dealing with things in such a way that life becomes more amazing and more wonderful. 
Uh, and so, and I think, I think that both need to be accounted for, you need to make space for both. And usually from my experience, a lot of the good stuff comes from people who, who find some way to find a relationship with their illness, with their death. In this way, they can be bigger than it too. Then they have some agency. They can have, they can participate in that relationship versus just be kind of flung around by it. Uh, you start off the book. Well, so first of all, we should acknowledge that you wrote this book with Shoshana Berger. Yeah. And could you say a little bit about her and how you came to write a book with her? Yeah. So Shosh and I met at IDEO, the design firm, where she's the editorial director. She's a journalist by training. She's editorial director at IDEO. That's where I met her. Like years ago, it was a longer story. I was actually um, invited into IDEO to talk about shoes for prosthetic feet. That was, oh. that, that was where it all started. <laughs> that's where it started. Yeah, that's it's where it all started. Pretty far from there, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's where it began. And that conversation led to discussion about the aesthetic domain and how things look and feel and the sensory experience of stuff and how it can be therapeutic. Um, when we were talking about it vis-a-vis shoes and prostheses, but it, it, you know, you could extrapolate from there. And that, that conversation about aesthetics led to conversation about my day job. And then, and then we started, and then they got much more interested because they have a healthcare practice and they were interested in the subject. And it seemed like this very ripe taboo thing that was, it was keen, that was ripe to be revisited. So we kept talking and had very interesting meetings. I didn't ever know where it was going. It was just kind of fun to be in a different industry talking about the things that we do in our, in our, in our lives, which seem otherwise dominated by healthcare. I mean, we know the subject is not just a medical one, but we tend to treat it that way um, by default. So it's just thrilling to be in this amazing office, creative minds whirling around and starting to think aspirationally about what could be, what could be different. And then that led to eventually, that's when I was at Zen Hospice Project, and we, we ended up hiring IDEO to do a little work on, on, on the website and other things. And during that project is when I really met or got to know Shoshana better because she was part of that project. Mm-hmm. And um, it, was very, it was very interesting being in that building around that sort of aspirational creative energy because there's a piece of you that has to sit there and you kind of can't help but roll your eyes because it's some of it's just so outlandish and so unrealistic and Mm. so ungrounded by Mm -hmm. the realities of dying. So I had to be sort of the party pooper in the room oftentimes and trying to Mm -hmm. bring it back down to earth. But then again, I also think we ignore the aspirational part at our own peril. Why, why couldn't it be better? Why couldn't our systems be better designed? Like, I don't, I don't think we could mandate a, a wonderful death like that would be setting people up for all sorts of disappointment. But mm. right now we sort of mandate a crappy death. Like, mm. like I'd like to get that out of the way so you don't necessarily fall into a junky death. But anyway, back to Shoshana. So we, she, she was, she saw this gap between reality and aspiration and she made some comment about her dad's recent death and all the regret she had and that changed the conversation very nicely. And she and I got, so then that's when I kind of got turned on to Shoshana's mind. And then she eventually asked me about the book. Um, I think we all know that there's a use for a book like this in the world, but she, she, her asking made a big difference. I wasn't tempted to do it otherwise, and I never would have written a book by myself. Mm-hmm. But as a non-clinician, someone who had been a caregiver, someone who was washing herself in the subject from a different angle, it seemed really smart to have a clinician and a non-clinician working on this subject. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. why we ran with that's it. That's great. So who is this book for? Like, who is your intended audience? It's written... I'm on some cheeky level for everyone, Alex, but the, you know, okay. But more practically, more realistically speaking, it's, it, it's written. The sensitivity of the language is, is geared towards someone who has either gotten a diagnosis uh, themselves or something's up, something's going wrong and they're in a vulnerable place. I mean, the tone is meant to be, to speak to them specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, the next rung out of course is their caregivers their family members or loved ones. Um, and in so many ways, they're interchangeable, mm-hmm. gearing the conversation to one or the other. And then from there, the third rung out is just us professionals and interested public lay people who just want to plan or neurotic or whatever else. Right. <laughs> so that's and, the way. It's and I see what you mean about there's a need for this book. There, there. This book is, you know, by way of overview, interested to hear what you have to say. My reflection mm-hmm. upon reading it is that it's just filled, as you say in the title, practical advice, yeah. practical yeah. advice. <laughs> yeah. This is the, the most practical guide, like guide to, yeah. you know, living and, uh, and dying with serious illness. 
um, uh, targeted primarily for people with serious illness, but also uh, for their caregivers and then other health professionals. Um, There isn't another book like this out there, is there? Not to, I mean, there's, you know, there's similar books. Steve Panelat's book has a, not a terrifically different table of content mm-hmm. on some level. Katie Butler's recent book, The Art of Dying Well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's been a rash of interest in the subject and, and more stuff coming into the public domain. Mm-hmm. Um, but there isn't a book quite like this that's mixing across issues and subject matter and is trying to speak to this common denominator among us, et cetera. So no, there isn't really. And I think the practical part of it is what stood out to me. You know, certainly there are components of, you know, practical advice in those other books, but just from the get go, you know, like in this book, like, um, well, how do I clean out my house? <laughs> like, yeah, right. you know, yeah. uh, how do I leave a legacy? What can I leave behind? And who, you know, how do I arrange for trust? Do your how do kids I really want your stuff? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And yeah. Facebook, like, should I post about this, you know, my illness on Facebook? Yeah. And uh, what's the difference between a mortuary and a funeral home? Well, right? it gets so specific that you wonder, how did you guys avoid big blind spots in the kinds of practical information to include? Well, we're not sure if we did. You know, that's uh-huh. why I'm so... Now it's getting sort of tested in the world. Is it actually, is this theory going to actually prove to be useful to people? And what, what did we miss? I mean, there was, it's a terrifying prospect because you know the subject's huge and trying to find what's going to be meaningfully relevant content to everybody or most everyone in this sort of denominator, but also the emotional content. How do you, one big challenge was trying to bring emotion into this plane too so people didn't feel that this was dry or didn't feel unseen or unheard but as you know people are in different places emotionally you know some like every time that we're tempted to say oh this is just going to be awful and you must feel so bad and must be like not necessarily and then all of a sudden you've prescribed the person to feel crappy so it was really tricky finding the right tone the right tenor the right amount of content I was tempted if I had written it by myself, it would have been longer and more complicated because I've been trying to capture everyone, every exception to every rule. But at some point you kind of have to let that go. And, but to your point, I, I, we, this is our first edition. Hopefully there'll be a second one and we're inviting a lot of feedback from the public. So hopefully they'll let us know where our blind spots are and then we can fix it. But it was, we had to start somewhere. It was Mm -hmm. terrifying but kind of exciting that way. So I can imagine as you wrote this, you you probably learned a whole lot because I, I learned a ton just reading this book as a palliative care provider, like thinking, oh, yeah, these, these are some things that I should know about and think about and help people. Do you think having written this and putting it together, do you feel like you're a better palliative care provider now? Like yeah. thinking more holistically? Yes, for sure. And that, yes, just expanding the subject matter, you know, as we know in the field, there's plenty to think about just from our medical, nursing, social worker, chaplaincy angles. There's plenty. But if you're really trying to blow up this subject, or really not blow it up, sorry, if you're really trying to dig into the subject of suffering and quality of life and all, meaning, I mean, geez Louise, we, this, is, this should be a much bigger table. There's way more to that big endeavor of being a human being than just the medical model which suggests. So yeah, it expanded my own sense, my own purview of what's relevant to the subject. And then the, then the act of trying to articulate it and actually trying to write it out and put it on paper also forced my brain in, in a way that I think was good. Um, I don't know. It's actually, there's like a hangover. I'm trying to wash it out of my system because <laughs> writing to this mm-hmm. average non-person person that's not right in front of me, whose issues right, aren't right in front of me, kind of dared weird things to my brain. And I, I, I feel like I, I need to take a long internal shower. We'll <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, speaking of changes, um, you write in this book and your TED talk is sort of framed around your personal life experience, particularly mm-hmm. experience in college where you experience this accident where you lost part of your arm and parts of both legs. Mm-hmm. And for our listeners, you should go check out the TED Talk if you want to hear more about that. But I, I, I wonder if you could reflect on how that TED Talk has changed your life. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a great question, Alex, because honestly, excuse me. I mean, for me personally, it, it's, it was a huge difference. It, it, it changed my life in all sorts of ways, professionally. And, and for, for example, I, as a non-author, I would never have gotten a book deal. Shoshana had written before. That certainly helped us, but I would not have gotten a big book deal with the 
publisher like Simon Schuster if it hadn't been for that TED Talk. And since that TED Talk came out and it was doing well, that's what triggered me to leave Zen Hospice Project and try really to lean into this public thing, trying to actually bridge our profession with the public on some level, which is a lot of work to be done there. It's thrilling and exciting, but but also totally unknown. I'm just kind of flailing around. Um, but the TED Talk led to uh, I mean, the last three years, I've really made my living primarily by public speaking. Mm-hmm. And that's all, it's all because of the TED Talk. Right. The book deal, all because of the TED Talk, et cetera. So huge changes in my personal and professional life. Right. And it's like, BJ is like as much of a celebrity as we get. <laughs> like, in palliative care. Like, he is a celebrity, right? Like, so, so it's, a, it's awesome. <laughs> it's great. It's like, I think, we I do, hope. Yeah, you're a celebrity. I, I got right behind you is a poster of you, BJ. Um, <laughs> yeah. If you could sign that before yeah. you leave, yeah. we'd appreciate it. I got it. little hearts on it. Yeah. I mean, it's great. Like, we all were in med school around the same time, right? We were at UCSF. I was 02. I was class of 01, but then you leapt ahead of me because I took that year off. So you were my boss in fellowship, if you remember. Oh, yeah, yeah. You were my yeah, attendee. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he <laughs> remembers. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I believe we were all in med school at the same time, at the same place, and none of us knew each other. Wait a other. second. You were in UC? <laughs> you were O two as well? O two, O two, yeah. Here? I mean, I was... <laughs> I know. It's no weird. Jesus. <laughs> I met BJ That's in med class school briefly. briefly. I mean, we didn't know each other that well because I was joint medical programs and I took a year off to uh-huh. like travel the world and whatever. But um, yeah, no, like we knew you when. <laughs> like, or not. <laughs> or not. <laughs> Whether or not he knew you is the question. <laughs> I knew Alex. I knew that for in fellowship is where I really got to know Alex yeah. at all. I was going to spend some more time with him. But yeah. yeah. So it's great. It's terrific for the field. And I'm glad that there's so much like thirst and energy for this. Um, you know, for somebody mm-hmm. who's en- as engaging as you are, um, to be, you know, the, the, the voice of palliative care, a- um, with the community. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's a tremendous service that you're, you know, and offering. thanks, Alex. Uh, nice I'm wondering, thinking about your book, lots of great chapters. Was there one chapter that you were kind of most, most excited to write or like it gave you the most energy to write? Mm. Yeah, for me, the coping chapter, which was was really all about f- reframing fear, uh, and that was the most fun for me because that's that's just where I that's what I'm personally just most interested in the sort of philosophical issues, conceptual, so how do we frame ourselves in the world, and uh, blah, blah. so that that was the most fun for me to try to get that out, um, and then uh, maybe the next one up would be the love, sex, and relationships chapter. Mm. Um, oh, can we get into that one? <laughs> knock yourself out. <laughs> uh, let me just uh, flip to it here. Um, I remember there's one story in there that you kind of start out with. Oh, yeah, Eric's giving me <laughs> to get closer to the mic symbol. Yeah. <laughs> Signal. Proper mic position, <laughs> Alex. Right. It's hard when I'm trying to find it. Flip to it. You start off with a story of a, um, a man who dies while receiving um, oral sex from his <laughs> wife. Yeah. And uh, if there are any kids listening, earmuffs. <laughs> <Right. laughs> Where were you we 30 seconds ago? <laughs> we should have had an announcement at the beginning yeah. about the rating for this. We'll go the, back and the add that. The following episode is not... <laughs> we'll add that. It may be inappropriate for small children. We'll send you some <laughs> video clips. But in the hospital, right? And then you clarify just because it's important to clarify that he did not die from the oral sex. He died from his underlying disease. Right. But... Just uh, you know, yeah. whoa! Now I'm awake. I'm really, really. I do. <laughs> this is amazing. This chapter was well, so not sex, expecting that. Yeah, sex and de- death is you know not something that's generally talked about. Relationships, mm-hmm. sexuality near the end of life. Um, yeah. Tell us what it, what is. Well, that's know? like back to Eric's question earlier. On, like, did it expand the purview of how we think about our clinical work? Absolutely. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I often I generally don't think to bring up sex, and we're not really trained in that. So I've been. So my mom is used as a wheelchair. She had polio, and I've learned from her. So I used to go to doctor appointments with her when I was a kid, and I noticed this, and she pointed out to me, they would not. The, first of all, the exam room was not wheelchair accessible. Like how you, you can't even get your own patient into that. That's just crazy talk. And we, that's, that's another point. But also they didn't have exam tables. So the mom couldn't get up in stirrups. And so they would just forego the gun exam. And they also just sort of, sort of su- assumed, well, you're in a wheelchair. You're not having sex. Like that was the assumption. Like, and I, 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 she had a child with her. And obviously she does. I mean, the, the point was 
the the whole subject just gets completely not only ignored, but in the, it's there's a little bit of offense in there. We presume that someone who's sick couldn't be a sexual being. Like, mm-hmm. what the hell? That's this is fundamental, rudimentary. It's like a, like assuming that the person doesn't eat um, or sleep, and this is rudimentary stuff that just gets somehow forgotten. So it was very fun to open up that topic. Sorry, I'm rambling. Well, no, I kind of I kind of loved it because like when we think about the big taboos that we don't talk about in our culture, death and sex yeah. are like right up there, right up there. Yep. And they're carnal, they're base, they're visceral. And it was fun to make that link. This is not abstract stuff. This is bodily stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's really nice to work from the body out. Yeah. And it, it's okay to talk about both of them. Yeah. Like, cause they're important. It's actually maybe even very healthy to do so. Right. Yeah. And I like the way you say, you know, for, for many people who are living with serious illness, like intercourse is not possible. Yeah. It's easy like, forget intercourse, you know? <laughs> so much of this is about intimacy and finding ways in which you can be intimate with one another, you know, cuddling and touching in other mm-hmm. ways that are, you know, aside from intercourse itself. Um, yeah. And I, 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 I have to say, I've never, I'm going to admit this now, I don't think I've ever talked to a patient about this topic. Mm. I probably should have. There probably should have been opportunity. There probably were opportunities, but I have not done it. Like, how do you bring it up with a patient? Well, I think for me, I just oftentimes will. Sometimes, as it, as as it happens, like patients will lead us. There may be the couples in the room, and maybe you can tell that there's a uh, um, that there's a block, or that they're distant, or they're not sure how to touch. Or sometimes you can just feel that there's a there's a sensory thing missing and sometimes they'll kind of lead you to it by talking about how things are at home, you know, or something like that. But for the most part, it usually is from my experience, especially since we're in the book, it's simply something like, Hey, you know, I'll just prime them and say, you know, this illness affects every part of us in all sorts of ways. And sometimes we don't, we can, we in clinic will gloss over all sorts of very important things. Like for example, how's your sex life? Now, is there a sex life? And that off that alone, uh, it's the t- a couple of times I've brought that up with patients and it, it, instant tears, like instantaneously, t- instantaneous tears in the patient and, or the, or the loved one. And it's really moving because there's so, the tears are from, thank God. Now I get to talk about it. Thank God. Someone's asking me about it. And I hadn't let myself think about how much I actually missed that touch. So anyway, it seems like a pretty easy, um, it's been pretty easy to, to prime with people much like death because actually the feeling is, yeah, denial, sure, we're in denial. But actually, maybe that's a little overplayed. Maybe we're all sort of dying to talk about these things. We just don't know how or whether it's safe. That's been my experience. And it sounds like that priming sort of relieves the patients or their families mm-hmm. from the burden of having to take the leap to bring it up to yeah. the provider yes. first. Yes, exactly. Because there again, they're not sure if it's safe, if it's mm-hmm. weird, or if it's all right. You know, we all have all sorts of hangups on the subject. So you, as a physician, can cut through that so nicely. And just by virtue of practically bring it up with eye contact you've just normalized it for someone and made it okay just by asking i wanted to ask about this chapter on um, code status Mm. and in particular you have this wonderful phrase i don't have it open in front of me but you talk about how you know people usually ask about code status you know Mm -hmm. if you were to you know your heart, heart were to stop would you like us to attempt to restart it using electricity you know chest compressions Mm -hmm. and you say of course. And like, <laughs> what foolish person wouldn't say yes to that? Yeah. And you say the better question is, well, what is the better question? Well, like, and I learned this from David Weissman, actually, at the Medical College of Wisconsin. That's where I got, that's where I was in my, did my internship and did up an elective in palliative care with David Weissman. That's what really turned me on to the subject. Anyway, I, he, I learned from him, like he would just sit down in the bed and say, so, so when you die, you know, you'd frame it very often, not like when your heart, no, not this clinical. Sometimes he would say, so when you die, do you want us to help you make sure you're comfortable as you move through that? Like, that's a very different way of broaching the subject. It's a very direct way. And no one that, that, and that always went very, very well watching him do it. At the first, it was shocking to see him be like, whoa, sure. did you just say that? Right. But to a person, every patient appreciated it and it got a different answer. It's amazing. We should study that. I wonder well, if David should. Weissman's ever said that. Probably not. But I don't. Um, that'd be amazing, right? You ask this question that's targeted towards the same content because mm-hmm. it is true that you know when you're dying or very very close, uh, very likely to die, you know because eleven percent, as you quote in mm-hmm. the book, 
of people who undergo CPR in the hospital survive to discharge, and the rates approach zero for mm -hmm. people with cancer and organ failure and uh, dementia and other serious diseases. Like, that's a true, true statement. When you're dying or yeah. when you're nearing, you know, very likely to die, do you want us to treat you with, uh, you know, keep you as comfortable as possible yeah. throughout and that? And guide you experience. through that process or be with you, you know, company through that process and make sure you're comfortable. Something like that. Just a sweet sort of, we'll be there for you in this way. And I tell you, man, you, the, the difference a word makes. So saying when you die versus if you die. Mm. That right out of the shoots changes the dynamic and you'll get a different answer because then it's that's taken as a given, which of course it is. And it sends a very different signal to the patient versus if you die, if we screw up or if something goes wrong and, and you die, that's not that's not really accurate. And it sets the, 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 the listener up in a very different way. And man, I, you guys, we all know this, but the difference a word or a, sort of a framing makes in this whole enterprise is is stunning. Like I would love... Where are the linguists and the communication professionals and all this? I would love to study the difference a word can make. Wouldn't that be amazing if this became the norm across you know hospitals in the United mm. States for how we asked about code status with patients who were awesome. you know had serious illness? That'd be, be amazing. I yeah. agree. Wow, <laughs> you got to study this, Alex. That's good. Yeah, good research list, topic. Pal. There we <laughs> go. <laughs> good idea. Now we need to. One of the fellows to take it on. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked earlier, what was you know the the chapter that you were most enthusiastic about writing? What was the chapter that you struggled with the most? Mm. Well, so I just let me back up for the way the mechanics worked in the book. So Shoshana and I both we wrote half the book. Roughly each of us were primary author on half of the book. And you can probably pretty much tell which the from the table of contents which one was whose primary chapter. But so, and then we cross edited to kind of smooth out the narrator and smooth out the voice. But that's how that was our process. Each of us was primary author on half the book, and then we cross edited. Um, so I I was terrified. Like I would not have begun to know. Like I I was mostly scared of Shoshana's topics because I didn't have any primary experience. It's very for me. So much of the enterprise was lo looking inward and drawing from uh, situations that I had seen and been part of or whatever. So it was an introspective an introspective process. Whereas for Shoshana, it's sort of secondarily sourced journalism. Basically, she's collating information from disparate sources and bringing it together. Like it was a research enterprise, a very different. Um, and so that I, I just anything that was not from primary experience, I found really, really difficult, period. Um, I think the, the chapters just wading through, but more specifically, the one, can I afford to die? Mm -hmm. So the brutality of cost and all this and how that needs to be you know, another thing, another issue, you know, sort of like sex, it doesn't get, br get brought up, but it d dramatically affects the situation. That one was a, like a heartbreaker to kind of think through and work on. Um, the paperwork chapter, just trying to write out, trying to make sense of all the forms that we have to wade through when they don't really make sense and trying to put that uh, in a way that was in, in some way interesting or useful was really hard. And there are some that, that I, I learned about. Um, was it the ethical... Ethical will? Will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's an ethical will? So, yeah, so we also in advanced care planning, we know advanced care planning, we know advanced directives, and um, we know wills on some level. I think we all, these are sort of conventional things. And I think more of us are aware of legacy work. So letters, writing letters to un unborn grandkids or whatever, um, the leg legacy letter writing um, kind of e efforts. I think most of us are aware of, of that work um, growing. But a big piece of legacy is there. there is this tradition, this thousands of year old tradition. I can't remember how far it goes back, like Old Testament kind of stuff, um, that an ethical will be, whether it's written or an oral tradition, is what you, so sure, there's the stuff you pass on to your kids or not, but what messages, what lessons learned do you want to convey to people who come after you? That's the sort of the heart of an ethical will. What, what, like your persona, like your feelings, your view on things, the lessons you've learned, how do you pass those on? And the ethical will is a vehicle to do that. And I think you wanted to ask about the illustrations. Mm. I did. <laughs> Thank you, Alex, for that segue. <laughs> Um, I did want to ask about them. I noticed mm. that some of the illustrations help um, sort of 
prompt someone to feel a little bit contemplative when mm-hmm. they look at them and others help the content feel a little bit more lighthearted. And yeah. I, and I thought it was, and I really liked them. So I was curious how you guys came up. Yeah. Thank you. And that's, uh, that's a, it's a super important piece of the book. Like the, the Marina, a woman named Marina Luz is the illustrator and she's awesome. I mean, she does beautiful work and uh, all sorts of different areas. Um, so Shoshana and I, one of our, our first task was to find the right illustrator. We knew this book needed to be more than just a bunch of words on paper because it wasn't, it's just not, it's only a piece of how we learn and it doesn't convey nearly enough. So we knew there needed to be something visual and we knew it shouldn't be photographs. And then doodles have a way of, you know, no matter who, sort of who you are, what, where you're from, you can kind of find yourself in a cartoon um, in sort of magical ways. And and an early prompt with Marina was like an early he- heroic book that we drew from was, uh, you guys probably know this book from your father's sock drawer, if you're like me, which is the Joy of Sex book. <laughs> you guys ever saw that as kids? Check you your sock remember? drawers. <laughs> Check your dad's <laughs> sock drawers. <laughs> Do you guys know this book? Have you uh, seen this book? I'm familiar with that book. No. Yeah. <laughs> oh, go look it up. It's a, I, it's a classic. I got some reading to do It's from tonight. the 1970s, and it's all this these amazing sketches. I mean, they're like teaching people about sex through these sketches. You can imagine that'd be much more useful than words on some level, but the sketches were just so plain and to the point and in you could, anyone could find themselves in there it was just a really good example. And there's tons of white space around it. So those were very important to us. And as, and as you found, and like, um, it's not the doodle doesn't just isn't redundant to what the, the words are describing it. It's meant to evoke it from a different part of your brain, make you contemplate or see the subject from a different angle. It's meant to be additive, not just duplicative to the words. And I think, you know, uh, I think we did it. I think Marina did a pretty darn good job. And I think that's one way that books um, may be a little different. And I will just one say, say one more thing that the prompt to Marina and to the publisher, it's why we were able to get more pages with bigger print was that this, and this, we use this phrase a lot with everyone we, we worked with, which is the book needs, it's about essentially about palliative care one way or another. And that the book itself needs to be palliative, holding it, the paper, the, the mm. design needs to be itself reassuring or somehow pleasant, somehow pleasing that the book itself would be an object that's palliative yeah like um i i thought the illustrations really stood out and the idea that it made me think like why why did they like for the grief chapter i remember it was a dress on a hanger Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. i thought huh um like what am I supposed to be taking out of it? Like, well, then I like searched the grief chapter for like, are we going to talk about a dress on a hanger? Um, but then I guess like, wait, maybe that's like not actually like, can not you tell literal. me about that one? Yeah, not literal. It's meant to sort of be evocative. And for some of us, I think a lot of us get triggered in our grief when you see, you know, I, I recently came across my sister died years ago. I usually came recently came across an old sweater of hers. And what was so wrapped up in her sweater, I mean, I, there was, I could still smell her on it. There was a, and to see it without a body in it. And it just, it was, it was evocative in ways and it, 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 it got, it's almost like a sense of smell, you know, that'll cut through yeah. all sorts of things and transport you places uh, that words won't. Uh, it was similar, like, so that, that, that image is just meant to evoke a, the sort of hauntingness of, a, of an empty dress that something was, someone's gone there, but also these touchstones and how grief shows up in these really weird ways. You see something that reminds you of, of the person lost and it could be just about anything. You know, it reminds me of a couple of things. One is at the end of Brokeback Mountain when, mm. um, you know, one character finds the, the deceased character's shirt with the blood stain mm. on it from when they'd wrestled, you know, 20 years earlier and just yeah. ho- ho- talks to it and holds on to it. Yeah. And the other is after my dad died, I remember mm. going to his closet and opening it up and just hugging his clothes. Yeah, that's so beautiful. You know, is the smell and just the, as you said, it, it was like the closest I could get to him. Yeah, the material, the visceral yeah. stuff. And yeah, and the smell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, that's something I really liked about this book too. Like it, that, that just the feeling, like holding it, the weight, the, the colors used, the illustrations... It, it it was part of the book. Like it, it felt very well kind of the whole thing was, it was a whole, it was designed hmm. well. Thanks, man. You guys are really, this is exactly what we would ever hope to hear. Thank you. 
I wanted to ask about, so you, you started off today talking about how you know, our system's broken and we're steering people towards these terrible deaths. And you make a really strong effort in the book to not only challenge people to change their behaviors themselves, but also to think about their own goals and values and um, what sort of treatments might align with those. And some terrific prompts mm -hmm. so that patients and caregivers can push doctors and other healthcare professionals about, you know, is this, what will this treatment do for me? Mm -hmm. What can I expect realistically? What are the harms of this treatment? What are the, and I just love those priming sort of questions, mm -hmm. activating patients. And I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more, more about that component of the book. Yeah. Well, two things. One is for, for, for starters, one of the, one of the, another challenge in the book was because we know the healthcare system colors this experience so much. And I'm sure all of us have our critiques of this healthcare system and know how it could be different and better. And it's, it's one of the crazy making things about our jobs. Um, but we actually had to cut, we had much more critique of healthcare in here, but we cut all of it because again, this book is to meant to help people now mm -hmm. deal with what they have now, whether it's an illness or the family structure or the healthcare system, whatever it is. Like we're, this book is not going to, is not a criticism of the healthcare system per se. We had to bite our tongue mm -hmm. and that was deliberate. Um, but okay. So that's one point. And the second point though is, yeah, I think, it, you, know, you try to get folks yourself and your patient's family into sort of a ballpark, into a frame of mind that evinces other information. So when you start talking about what they love or what they miss or things like that, you know, that gets their that primes the mind to think in a certain way and, and, and sets a nice open tone of what you a clinician are welcoming into this mix, which should be just about anything. So um, these little sort of just sprinkling the reader with questions to get them sort of in the mood, in the mindset, because most of us in our day-to-day -day grinds aren't thinking about these things, and it does take a little bit of a shift. Um, does that answer your question, Yeah, Alex? yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's yeah. so useful because so many of us, we don't know what we don't know. Right. You know, so how do I know what the right questions right. are? Because this is uncharted territory. Right. And it gives them a little bit of a cheat sheet. Right. And that's exactly right. I think what we're all looking for on any side is some confidence that things are as good as can be. No one's going to say this is going to be easy or perfect, or hopefully they're not going to say that. But what I think we're all striving for is a sense of confidence that things are as good as can be. And that is a very murky, unclear uh, note to hit, but you kind of know it when you feel it. Um, but then I think also sort of practically, sometimes it means some, some basic translation moments. Like when we use the word treatment, I mean, I think it's a, I've, this one's a magical one. I've talked to the, when I'm giving public talks, like just encouraging a patient, a person to ask their doctor, what do you mean by the word treatment is a huge opener because we move that one around. Usually we mean life extending treatments in contrast to palliative care kind of treatments, but we keep using the T word in there. So it's confusing as hell. And if a patient asks a doctor, what do you mean by treatment? That's going to be a really good challenge for the doctor to find, Ooh, do what, what do I mean by that word? That's my favorite kind of real easy tell. Mm -hmm. And we need both in order to change the system. And we need both you know, people who are trying to train doctors to have better communication skills, like we had Wendy Anderson on, many other people. Mm. But we also need to activate patients to, hey, you know, check your doctor. Yes. Check them, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because n most docs aren't going to receive those communication skills trainings as hard as we try. Right. Uh, but there, if we can get all patients out there, all people, right. caregivers, people to ask these questions and check their doctors, we may actually... Um, have bigger change. I, that's what I, that's my, I, I wholly ascribe to that theory. Like that's another reason to sort of reach out into the public these days. Cause I don't think we're going to get there left to our own devices in t inside of healthcare. If we keep guessing what our patients want and they're not activated and engaged, that's, we're never going to get there without our patients, obviously. So kind of from the, the bigger perspective, are there things that our listeners can do to, to, to make those that, that reach out to the public or to, to make that larger change of the system, not just for the individual patient, but to mm. either shift what we're talking about or, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I think you guys are doing it with this podcast. I mean, here's one example. I mean, I think just the subject, or really 
is it a singular subject? This is a suite of subjects, basically, of what it means to be a human being. I don't know how else to put it. That's the human condition. We suffer, we die, we have joys, we have bodies. You know, that seems to be the sort of our subject matter, really. And that is friggin' huge. So when I say the subject, I mean, it really is a suite of subjects. And I think what's very useful, if we all b- believe for our sake as clinicians as well as, as our sake, for our sake as patients and loved ones, et cetera, for our sake as people, um, we need we need a lot of minds thinking on this subject from many different angles. So you have to kind of lay out a lot of on-ramps for people. For some of us, it's the clinical work that gets us, brings us there. For some of us, it needs to be a personal experience. For some of us, it's philosophy, thinking about existentialism. For some of us, religion. Um, you know, some of it's financial. One of, one of the exciting things, though, for our field and for the subject matter, a suite of subject matter, is you can, f- like, all roads are pointing this direction. You can be s- interested in the subject just because you're a bean counter and wanting to save money. You know, that would point you in the same direction we're looking. You can be interested from an ethical point of view, a social point of view, a personal point of view, but you just name it. So I think we just need, as back to your question, Eric, for all of us in this field, there's the work we do on our day to day sort of jobs with patients and others, but through your research, through how you teach, how you show up yourself, do you hide your own suffering? Do you, do you share with your team when you're going through a hard time? Do you reach out to your neighbor when you know he's depressed? I don't know whatever it is, but I, I think on some level, each of us can do a lot by kind of living out loud a little bit more when it comes to our own uh, vulnerabilities and we can model things as clinicians for people, but also we can teach in different ways. You can bring your, the things you love in life into the way you teach your, uh, your, your medical work. Anyway, I think the idea is just to broaden the subject or the subject is broad. We keep reducing it. So I think the idea is for us to kind of like be in touch with how big, how uncontrollable, how much larger than ourselves this subject is. And then that kind of opens the door for us to bring all sorts of other things into the mix. That's profound. That's Mm -hmm. great. Thanks. We should wrap it up. Yeah. Yeah. Any last questions or anything else that you wanted to make sure you... No, no, that's great, guys. I mean, this talk for hours. Just, with you I know we could talk for hours. Mm. Um, How about we sing for a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Hey, <laughs> let's let's run it back from the beginning. Let's do the whole thing. You're gonna do the whole thing. We're gonna do the whole okay. thing from All the right. beginning. And you're gonna join in the distance. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. Everyone should s- wait in I'm suspense. Scared. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that is my favorite thing about death, by the way. It's like, I don't know about you guys, but the fact that either, even if you do all your homework, you're going to die. If you do everything right, you're going to die. If you don't do anything right, you're going to die. It sort of frees you up to try and not worry so much about making an ass of yourself. At least that's what I tell myself. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Thank you, BJ. Here we go. I know, I know you belong to somebody new, but tonight you belong to me. Although, Although we're apart, you're part, part of my heart, heart but tonight. You belong to me. Way down, way down by the stream, by the stream. How sweet it will seem once more, just to dream in the moonlight. My heart, I know, I know, with the dawn that you. Tonight you belong to me, but tonight you belong to me, just a little old me. <laughs> I kept on waiting for somebody to bring in like a saxophone. Wait, what did she bring in? Trumpet. In the a trumpet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she, she just launches in with a trumpet. <laughs> I thought you were going to pull out a trumpet out of <laughs> your bag. <laughs> <laughs> <So good. laughs> Maybe I'll go back and insert it into the podcast. <laughs> Oh, uh, thank you, you so guys. much, BJ. Thank you thank so much you for joining us. So today. much. Just, just nothing have. but fun. Great to chat. Thank Great you. To catch up. 
And a uh, big thank you to all of our listeners. If you have a moment, please uh, share our podcast with your friends and family or wherever you think you would like it and take a moment to rate us on your favorite podcasting app. Until next time. <laughs> Bye.